This week in the parish of Bourses and Market Structure, there's a new chairman at NZX. Adina Friedman argues for AI regulatory sense. And 63 moons hit MCX's profit. My name is Patrick L. Young. Welcome to the Bourse Business Weekly Digest. It's the Exchange Invest Weekly Podcast, episode 195. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very brief reduction of highlights amongst the key headlines from the week in market structure. All the analysis of the many events and happenings from the past seven days can be found in Exchange Invest's daily subscriber newsletter. The unique guide to the bourse business sent daily to your inbox. More details via our brand new beta website at exchangeinvest.com. We had a brief update on Young's Pyramid this week. Tier 1 looking very, very exciting. That's the biggest names of all. And the top two really fascinate. CME, is it somewhat becalmed? ICE, do they have detail on their side in terms of future profitability? And indeed, no matter what happens with their current contested FTC, disapproved as we speak today, future merger plans, that strikes me that Clarity is going to lift the stock at Intercontinental. More excitingly still, Hong Kong Exchanges finds itself at the bottom of the group, admittedly only $15 billion adrift from the top number, the $65 billion CME group. And yet, Hong Kong Exchanges prospects have never seen better, with the RMB counter opening in a month's time, and all sorts of exciting happenings on the Connect platform with, of course, an RMB yield curve coming to Hong Kong soon. From the top of Young's Pyramid of Exchanges, we move to BitCarnage. Slammer time was one of the headlines we ran this week with Elizabeth Holmes now heading to jail on May the 30th. Check in by 1400 apparently. And I appreciate that the finger-pricking bad non-tech of Theranos and its simply bloody fraud has no immediate bit carnage relationship. However, this leads to a handy comparison between two criminal fraudsters, both of whom share a penchant for denial and a determination to fight charges interminably. Thus, it's interesting to compare the numbers, the scores and the doors, if you like it, of how long Holmes is now heading to jail for at a Vast discount, 80 actually, gosh, 86% discount to the number of years she was sentenced to, but nonetheless, it still amounts to greater than 11 years. What's going to happen to Sam Bankman Freed currently on charges which could lead him to be 115 years in jail, even if he gets an 86% discount la like La Holmes? He's still looking at a long, long spell behind bars. If you enjoyed this excerpt, you may be interested to know that you can read Bit Carnage every day in Exchange Invest. Alternatively, if you don't want to hop over to exchangeinvest.com for that subscription, why not visit us on Substack, where you can follow Bit Carnage exclusively in its own right, uniquely giving you insights about the market structure of the crypto and digital asset economy daily. In legacy exchange news this week, Chicago's new mayor, Brandon Johnson, is already proving bad for business. The message that exchanges are not rooted to any particular city ought to strike fear into the heart of every municipality in the United States of America, as the only one I've visited in recent times which appeared to be efficiently run is Miami, albeit I've heard good things about Atlanta too. But clearly, New York, Chicago and San Francisco are just three disasters that are making the US a laughing stock for political mismanagement. There's an ongoing apocalypse. They call it Apocalypse Nearly for the London Stock Exchange in a Motley Fool article this week. At the same time, it's very difficult to see where the positives lie for the London Stock Exchange right now. Take, for example, the fact that their latest move involves trying to launch a private market for stocks, 
we'd rather suggest that they've given up on the whole concept of public market listings. One person still battling to make equity sexy. I suppose almost to make London Stock Exchange great again, or at least to make London's stock exchanges great again, is the Aquas chief executive, Alistair Haynes, who's been talking about his role in boosting the city as he celebrates the 10th anniversary of Aquas Exchange. All the very, very best to Aquas on making it one decade in business. Meanwhile, the Financial Times, I mean, that is the Brussels Bugle, as we call it, the in-house newspaper of the Eurocracy bureaucracy. They're under pressure to extend access to the London Clearing Houses. The driving factor to access to the London Clearing Houses is, of course, a recent survey by Acuity. And Acuity noted that of their respondents, barely 8% actually had any faith in the European Union's protectionist drive to close London's markets out of Eurozone clearing. That's a pretty damning indictment all round. More optimistic stuff. Hong Kong's revamped IPO rules and dual currency trading counter will drive yuan internationalization and tech innovation, according to Hong Kong exchanges. And indeed, we're minded to entirely agree. Another area where we're entirely minded to agree was the FT op-ed this week, Harness the Power of AI to Tackle Financial Crime, which was written by none other than the Nasdaq Group CEO and Chairman, Adina Friedman. It reminded me rather of a 2018 World Traders Company annual Tacitus Lecture, where Nathan Mervold of Microsoft fame gave a great presentation, Cyber Trade Will AI displace or enhance our work. Mervold at that point in time referred to the innovation menace and that's a perfect description of something the media have gone to great lengths to scaremonger about with gusto. Adina carried on the theme elegantly from her own direct Nasdaq experience noting while calls for caution and proactive regulation are appropriate so are the calls for urgency and optimism as we empower industries to start harnessing the potential of the AI advances. Twice in a week, therefore, having of course given that fabulous American University golden AU, ha ha ha, get it, commencement address, Adina Friedman has been the parish queen of Mojust for exchanges. Singapore Exchanges Group, they've got some good news with the Shanghai Stock Exchange. They're deepening their partnership with the ETF link connecting Singapore and China, while the Egyptian Ministry of Finance has resumed negotiations to link ECSD, that's with Euroclear. That would, of course, allow for offsetting settlement between Egypt and the European Union. Of course, the thing here is scratch the surface, and Egypt is spectacularly bust post-COVID, hence a series of sudden pressure deregulations, including an upcoming IPO privatisation wave. That may sound cynical, but optimistically, we must live and hope that Egypt's shotgun conversion to freer markets and embracing privatisation will mimic the magnificent reforms of the David Lange government, which transformed New Zealand during the 1980s. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly. We welcome your feedback. You can contact me directly, patrick at derivativesvision.com with any comments. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed this show, we would welcome you giving us a thumbs up. Or if you have time, a positive review will always be welcome wherever you find this podcast. Results. It was a busy week for results in the parish this week. All the details were in Exchange Invest Daily, the newsletter no person can afford to be without in capital markets and market structure. For the sake of this podcast, let's look at some edited highlights. Moscow Exchange remains remarkably resilient despite sanctions and the general closing of the Russian economy, at least to the West. Of course, as we can see from Chinese trade numbers, some people are still doing a lot of business with Russia. Anyway, operating income up 6.9% net profit jumping back up 77%. Of course, that was year on year back to the dark times for the Moscow exchange immediately after they were blindsided by Vladimir Putin's rather bonkers invasion of Ukraine. Similarly, the Warsaw Stock Exchange, they enjoyed their second best quarterly revenue ever, only up slightly to 1.8% from the previous quarter. Sadly, a bit of a decline in net profit, though, down 29% due to various expenses. On the other hand, the most spectacular decline in profit for the quarter for all members of the parish was MCX, the multi-quantity exchange of India. Their net profit tumbled 85% on 
what was euphemistically called higher software support charges. Look, in terms of historically suicidal screw-ups, I'm not sure anybody can compete with the surreal arrogance come stupidity of the MCX when they plumped for Tata TCS to replace the financial technology systems. Financial technologies, you will recall, are now re known as 63 moons and they powered the MCX originally. Indeed, had it not been for the NSEL debacle, 63 Moons, Financial Technologies and Chignesh Shah would have still controlled the MCX, the multi commodity Exchange of India itself. Thus, the new board of MCX underwent a rather, frankly, vindictive move to oust the IT system built by MCX founder Jignesh Shah. And thus, everything fell apart in due course when TCS failed to deliver, leaving Mr. Shah with the whip hand to extract a monopoly rent for ongoing customer support from MCX. Huge shareholder value deterioration in one quarter alone, as well as management looking embarrassingly incapable. New markets this week. All about power, first of all. Power and emissions is the whole sweep of our interest all across Southeast Asia. An exchange-led power market will transform South Asian power cooperation, notes Pakistan today, where there's excitement over an exchange-led power market across borders in South Asia, including Bangladesh and Nepal, as well as Pakistan. Once, of course, India, which sits somewhat in the middle, is able to consent over in Vietnam, they're going to launch their first exchange for carbon emissions trading by 2028. Deal news this week, not such a fantastic news for deals. Nonetheless, the Blackstone Thomson Reuters Consortium sold $3.4 billion worth of LSEG shares at a 5% market discount, giving them a very nice and handy return, despite the fact that LSEG shares are still some way off their all-time high. Meanwhile, EEX is entering Lithuania, the world's leading energy exchange, signing on in Vilnius by buying AB Amber Grid. Most exciting deal news of the week, though I suspect, is really UBS. They've been courting funds for the carbon exchange Expansive. We've previously noted Expansive CBL had been looking at an IPO. It's interesting that they appear to be looking to their original Australian base after a Nothing to buy here, Roadshow with UBS, which is one of those sorts of interesting practice processes, a little bit akin to how some people take their thoroughbred horses to the track and leave it in a stable on race day before driving it home without actually running. Pour encourager les autres jours, I suppose. If you're trying to understand the future of finance, then you should be picking up a copy of my most recent book, Victory or Death, Blockchain, Cryptocurrency and the Fintech World. It's published by DV Books and Victory or Death is distributed by Ingram Worldwide. While you're waiting for your copy of Victory or Death to arrive, check out our live stream Tuesday, 6pm London time, 1 o'clock New York time, the IPO video live show. Catch the back episodes on Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube via IPO-vid. Now online, our latest show, number 107... This IPO vid was with Paul Constantino and Patrick Kenny, President and Chairman respectively of the Association of Futures Markets, and looks both forward and back, forward two weeks to the upcoming Budapest 25th anniversary meeting of the AFM, and also of course back through an incredible history that is now an organisation looking forward to what it can do in the next quarter century. Coming up next week, we've got a fantastic show, Markets for the Next Generation, IPO Vid 108. That's going to be with Guidon Hurston, the founder of the Hurston Group, and I think a world-famous name across the exchange landscape and exchange-traded derivatives. Guidon will be joining us at the same time as usual, Tuesdays, 1 o'clock Eastern, 6 p.m. London, 7 p.m. Central European time. In product news this week, that hugely exciting dual counter model is going to be launching Hong Kong dollars and Remnimbi. You will be able to trade on your stocks on 19th of June 2023. Already more than 20 shares representing nearly 40% of Hong Kong exchanges turnover have applied to have their shares traded in Wham. That sounds like catnip for Hong Kong exchanges, and this is surely only the beginning of a massive transformation in global stock trading, not forgetting that the exchange is moving towards a full RMB yield curve trade via Hong Kong exchanges and Connect in the near future too. 
Meanwhile, LME, the London Metals Exchange subsidiary of Hong Kong Exchanges, it's working with Chinese Commodities Exchange to launch EV battery metals contracts as demands and prices surge. That's with the QME, the Quinhai Mercantile Exchange, which is, of course, also a subsidiary of Hong Kong Exchanges. Euronex, they're going to be launching dark share trading by Q4, another nail in the profitability of TPI Cap owned LiquidNet, it seems, while LCH SwapClear has completed their LIBOR to SOFR transition. Technology news this week the dream is over. ASX has finally abandoned blockchain for its chess replacement project. Having created nothing apart from a two-element Venn diagram involving huge circles depicting time spent and money wasted, ASX has given Australia a reputation for incapacity of execution in line with the worst of Anglo-German physical infrastructure builds over the course of the last decade or so. QV, the UK HS2, with real waste of time. Decades and gazillions spent already to save barely half an hour or so across bits of England in about 20 years' time. And then, of course, in Germany, the new Berlin-Brandenburg Airport, as discussed by PLY in a Phase 8 after-dinner speech some years ago. Anyway, back to ASX. Without yet the resignation of the remaining numpties of the C-suite, it might be sensible for a company with a sense of collective responsibility or shame to actually dismiss already Mr Chairman goodbye would seem to be the most appropriate two words in the English language for your tenure right now. ASRX has unceremoniously dumped its blockchain ambitions. In other words, the self-professed technology company is clearly not as IT literate as it likes to hype itself. Rather, it has spectacularly distributed egg across not merely its face, but left a sour taste with the parish on every other continent as well as Terra Australis. No exchange did more to lead the world's market operators through transformation of structure, technology, innovation et al. than ASX achieved before its entirely self-inflicted monopoly dark age regression. The ASX group has done more to lag behind its parish peers than any sensible person could have thought reasonable when they looked at the exciting prospects for ASX and SFE even as standalones in 2000 AD. What a tragic snafu of gooboo proportions. Fascinating article in the New York Post this week raising some interesting thoughts. The headline ran, China goes for broker, digging into the possible concern over stock trading apps. It's a very, very fascinating article. Never mind about TikTok, the narrative goes. Have you given your full personal data to AML KYC at a Chinese-owned broker? I'm not saying I remotely agree with Charles Gasparino's stance here, but it is a very thought-provoking article. The LSE, a rare moment of success, they've reported having their latency following their data center migration. LSE's ETF order book has seen a 66% reduction in average round trip latency, with outliers down by 80%. There's also the fact, of course, that having closed down their entire technology sales department for exchange technology, LSE latency of delivery of exchange tech to third parties has recently grown infinitely. Career paths this week, Stefan Bujna has been reappointed as CEO and Chairman of the Managing Board of Euronext. Well deserved. Bujna is a highly effective leader of Euronext and has crafted a much broader business through multiple M&A deals during his first spell in office. Meanwhile, John McMahon has been named as New Zealand Exchange's chair. That was precisely as predicted predicted a week earlier in Exchange Invest 2655 on May the 10th. All the very, very best to James Miller, who took NZX from being somewhat adrift to a much more coherent enterprise during his term. His counsel has been wise and his execution sound. He leaves office with NZX in a much better place than I could have imagined when he joined. Such was the aura of decay and defeatism around the exchange. All the very, very best to John McMahon in maintaining this momentum. Finally, in career paths this week, uh, Murad Ben Shaban has been re-elected as president of the Tunis Stock Exchange Board of Directors following their annual General Assembly. And that leaves me, ladies and gentlemen, to ponder a decentralised conundrum. This week, we had a press release from ForkSwap. It trumpets itself as a Web3 company that builds decentralised exchanges. Now, there's a conundrum for you, ladies and gentlemen. How do you build a decentralised exchange? I'm always minded to wonder how you know where you put your decks, given the nature of its definition. 
and on that mysterious and magnificent note. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Patrick L. Young. Thank you for listening to this number 195 EI Weekly Podcast. I wish you all, as an inveterate builder of markets the world over and publisher of Exchange Invest via exchangeinvest.com, have a great week in blockchain, life and markets. This show relates to the business of bourses. It is not to be construed as investment advice, nor are we making any investment recommendations. Please consult an investment advisor before you make any investments, and for goodness sake, do your due diligence and do not make investments without complying with the regulations in your home state. Exchange Invest cannot be held responsible for any investment decisions made as a result of our programme, which is for entertainment purposes only. The material herein is copyright Patrick L. Young at the date of publication, while our music and sound effects are sourced from copyright-free sources. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly, the exchange of information.